Oi oi, it's your boy. Steve Winwood to Heavy Hands' is Kygo and Whitney Houston, Jack Slack, and it's the Fight's Gone By podcast. Coming at you following UFC 241, didn't actually get a pre-fight preview uh, podcast out in time because I was working on that um, Filthy Casuals guide to Daniel Cormier, did a preview article on Unibet and also one on um, Ramiro versus Costa, the Juicy Boys at the Fight Primer for the Patreon Boys. But I thought a rather good night of fights. No real news today. Amanda Nunez is fighting Jermaine Durandamy at UFC 245. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> Jermaine Durandamy might beat her, which would be very embarrassing for the UFC. But, you know, let's talk about interesting stuff instead. There was a one event earlier in the week. Didn't watch it. Saw Giorgio Petrosian beat Joe Natawa. That was good. Clipped him with a really good... Well, came around the side with a, a left hand counter through the open side every time that Natawart stepped in. Natawart started hanging his right hand really high and wide and uh, Petrosian just shot straight down the center. One of the nicest straights you'll see in recent years. Um, just put him on his ass. Fantastic. Shame they had to jip Petch Monocot to get him there but you know it is what it is. I think the real shame is that they didn't just jip Sani- Sammy Sano as well and then make Yodson Cly versus Giorgio in the final like they wanted to in the first place. But let's talk about UFC 241 because that was the bomb. Um, what was good? Brandon Davis versus Kyung Ho Kang, Kang rather, or Kung, depending on who's calling it, was good. Um, I, I remember Brandon Davis from the fight with um, Zabit, Zabit, sorry, uh, where he actually showed up some of Zabit's uh, defensive uh, flaws, you know, his, his ability to overreact to even a partially good jab. Um, but Davis was doing well in this one, hacking in that low, low kick, which I'm sure we're going to talk about later because we've got a couple of questions about. And it was nice listening to uh, the, the three-man booth, Rogan, Anik and uh, Cruz, just chatting about why that technique has taken off so much in like the last two years. I thought that was a good little uh, distraction. Um, Swaggy G, was <laughs> the ref, was uh, out for blood. He just wanted to see some teeth on the mat. The mouthpiece came out of Davis and, and he was there for about 40, 50 seconds not putting it back in <laughs> there was so there were loads of chances to but davis just had to like up the pressure to to keep kang kang off him you know so that he wouldn't get his teeth knocked out uh it was pretty scary actually but, yeah, i mean if you saw uh what was that the mir his last fight was it that javier vala when he fought in uh, bellator got hit without his mouthpiece in and he immediately tapped out he was like nah fuck that <laughs> it's not worth it um, especially if you're American because you, your dental care costs so much and you care so much about it but yeah I thought it was, it was pretty good Brandon Davis's corner were fantastic good old boy in his corner give him great uh, advice and also top quality phrases like you need to use that jab because my shit ain't tickling uh, <laughs> which I'm now going to use for everything I'm going to be like well Koji Horiguchi ate a stiff right hand and I'll tell you my shit ain't tickling um yeah, he was great. And then in the third round, he's like, knock this fucker out. Um, but yeah, really weird stand-ups from Swaggy G, standing them up from the side control. But again, Kung wasn't really doing anything. I'm I'm opposed generally to standing people up from side control. But also, if you're just holding on, you know, fuck you. Kung actually got the split uh, got the split decision in this one. And I think it was mainly that last round that lost Davis this, because he was doing really well in the first two. Slipped in the third, ended up bottom of side control, got restarted uh, on the feet. And then got taken down straight into side control. Bit of a shame as he started so well. But Kang looked good. I, I thought these guys both looked pretty good. It was a good technical scrap um, from guys who aren't, you know, top level yet. But are, are doing decently and on their way up. Sifas versus Escabel was, you know, as, as much as you can expect from an Escabel fight. Um, Casey Kenny versus Manny Bermudez. I really enjoyed this one. Casey Kenny, tiny for the weight class. Why? Why? Um... Listed here at 140, did they do this one at catch weight? Because I can't remember. But Manny Bermudez was fucking enormous. Um, but the grappling in this one was so solid. There was a bit where Kenny... Firstly, Kenny was doing really well on the ground, given how much smaller he looked. But there was a bit where he had side control on Bermudez. Bermudez was trying to escape, and then he got the cross-facing arm free, so the hand that would be on the head uh, from side control. He pushes that away, tries to throw his legs over the top, which is an escape that um, Jessica Penne used to do in Invicta. And also Liam McGeary does that a lot. Like he'll push the hand free, throw his legs over his head, doing the the old Elton John or Marilyn Manson stretch, depending on who was the variation when you were growing up. Um, 
and uh, you know catch a foot inside the arm. You can either start pushing them back away from you and, and start kind of trying to come on top, or you can roll all the way back over your own head uh, and, and come up into like a, a crucifix position in the turtle. And he, he went for that, missed it, and then brought his legs down and caught a half guard on the opposite leg, uh, which was proper strange, and then he ended up sweeping from there. And there were all kinds of moments like that. It was really good. Um, the striking was a bit messy. Bermuda's obviously hit a lot harder than Kennedy, uh, Kenny. And between the second and third... Firstly, great corner advice from both teams in this one, because uh, between the second and third round, Bermudez's corner said, get that wrist and just throw the right hand down the centre or the left hand, whichever he was. He was either the southpaw or the orthodox. I can't remember which one was which. Um, but, you know, hold that lead hand, throw your rear hand down the centre. And Kenny's corner told him to punch the guy in the throat. <laughs> it's just like, I, I'm pretty sure that's a foul. Um, it's a bit like if you get caught telling, them, telling your corner to butt. You know, you, you should be fined for that, probably. But um, still funny nonetheless. And then Manny Bermudez, instead of coming out and trying to control Kenny's lead hand, he holds his arm up like sideways and Kenny grabs his hand and Bermudez punches him straight in the face with his free hand. And he did that about three times. It was amazing. I was like, I've never seen that before, but uh, you know, maybe maybe I can get it working on, on people. I don't know. I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, but yeah, I thought this was a really solid scrap. I will definitely be watching more of Kenny and Bermudez in the future. Kenny got the decision. He's 13 and 1 now. Um, Manny Bermudez falls to 14 and 1. So you had, you know, 12 and 1 versus 13 and 0. That's a really solid matchup for such an early prelim bout. Drakkar Close versus uh, Christos Yagos, I think they called him. Giagos? Hiagos? What's that sandwich? Hiro? Gyro? Um, yeah, I thought this was a, a good scrap. Well, firstly, Yagos came out and was putting it on. Dra uh, Draco Close. Draco Close could not get anything going, and Draco Close has always been like the um, a bit of a bully in uh, in his weight class. And to be fair, I've always had beef with Draco Close because I think mainly, um, well, he always comes off as an ass, and he did come off as an ass in this fight. He was an ass in the interviews afterwards. He was an ass when they finished the fight, and Yagos immediately went to shake his hand, and he threw his hands up and turned away. <laughs> like, he, he saw him do it, and he was like, nah. <laughs> um, but also, like, constantly cheating he was grabbing the glove in this one um and in the what was it the lander no it was the david tamer fight he was being battered by tamer on the feet and then he was like why aren't you engaging me <laughs> throwing his arms out getting hit in the face while doing it and then herb dean herb dean who's just on a roll for the last two years uh steps in and goes hey david tamer engage <laughs> and you're like fuck off herb are you watching the fight but Yagos faded pretty badly um, towards like the end of the second round. And I was watching this. He, he was in Claudio, Gade Claudio Gadelia position where he had done enough to win one and a half rounds, which is normally enough to get you the, the win, you know, if you go to decision. But he really dropped the ball in the last like one and a half rounds, basically just got the, the shit slapped out of him. Uh, was like mouth open, throwing punches, really obviously tired. Um, and and that's when close came forward and really poured it on. Then you're getting into the good stuff. I told you that this would be good last week. Um, did I? No, maybe I didn't. Oh, no, I did a little bit of a preview in it in the Patreon Boy one. But um, Corey Sandhagen versus Rafael Asuncao. And I said this immediately after seeing this. Someone should have told Rafael Asuncao that it takes two to tango and that he should just not engage. Because <laughs> that was the thing. Like, Valentina Shevchenko, the big excuse is, oh, it takes two to tango. Everyone just forgot every single occurrence of a fight where one person didn't want to engage and the other one just went forward anyway. Corey Sandhagen in this one, brilliant pressure, kept it up the entire time. And Rafael Sunset, you, you know, you saw in the opening exchanges what he wanted to do. Uh, uh, Sandhagen would throw something, he'd come back with like a, a jab and low kick or a, a couple of punches. Um, and then Sandhagen wasn't at all stifled by that, which is part of the uphill struggle of fighting a Sunset. His fights are dull because he turns very good fighters into very inactive fighters. And there are lots of guys who do that. You know, you turn a, a 50 punch around fighter into a, a 10 punch around fighter. It's a talent and it's not a very appealing talent, <laughs> but it is still a talent. Um, and a Sunset does that. And Corey Sanhagen did not fall into that, which is, you know, easier said than done. Move forward lots. Constant fainting, the amount of feints and the volume of the strikes, because he wasn't just fainting and he wasn't just striking. He was making sure that he was constantly fainting, but also throwing out a ton of strikes, and that made it very hard for a sunset to counter. And you saw, like the the um, 
you know, the, the output really started to go towards Sandhagen and uh, Sunsail really wasn't doing as much. What we said in the preview piece was that um, the pressure is going to be interesting. And this was kind of something we matched up with the, uh, the Ramiro Costa fight. But we were saying the pressure is going to be interesting uh, and, and the crowding of a Sunsail. But uh, can a Sunsail hit the level changes? Because if you're always going forward, the level changes are more of a threat. You are almost you're giving up your hips a lot more easily than if you're like you know anderson silva leota machida running around the cage backwards you know uh it, you sacrifice a little bit of safety to to actually put strikes on your opponent by going forward um and as i did he hit he did hit the takedown at one point Corey sunhagen was doing very well with the um kimura trap stuff uh you know going for the kimura over the head as uh, a sunset ducked in on him the grappling exchanges in was it round two because that was absolutely incredible um it was it was really interesting it divided the bjj community i was on the bjj subreddit and um lots of people were like wow that was re- just really high level stuff and uh, the general consensus is like you know no gi is a lot more flowy than gi anyway you know there there isn't that strict hierarchy of of grips and stuff um and also mma with strikes is even more flowy and especially with the ability to just get back to your feet and, and break free which is uh, you know, half of anyone's goal when they're in a grappling exchange in MMA. And then down the bottom of the comments section in the badly you know, downvoted ones, it's full of blue belts being like, what sloppy shit? <laughs> like, uh, really? Because, I mean, there were some weird positions they ended up scrambling into. Like there was a, uh, he, he looked like he, uh, a Sunset had, uh, he was reaping Sanhagen's knee, but he also had sort of like an omoplata. So th- it, there was the threat of the omoplata, but the knee was in the way. And there was the threat of the heel hook, but the arm was in the way. <laughs> so he didn't really have anything, but he was like, I've got to make something happen out of this. Um, there was an interesting one where Asuncao went from um, De La Hiva. And Asuncao has an interesting guard. I said that in the um, Mariah's fight, the second one, uh, even though he was hurt and he ultimately got choked was it choked yeah he ultimately got finished regardless but um when he was hurt he was playing a very good guard he went from like uh half butterfly to half trying to come up on the single back to half butterfly to butterfly to full guard to butterfly and he was just switching between to try and make something happen you know he was either getting up or pulling the guy close and looking for the restart or getting up um and uh you know, he's always had an interesting guard game. You just, you just don't see a lot of it because, again, he has these fights where he's out at long range and not a lot is happening. Um, but he goes from the De La Hiva and he does uh, what is quite a basic um, single, sorry, uh, single leg, I suppose, but uh, sweep attempt from the De La Hiva. And it works a lot better in the gi because in the gi, you take the collar grip. So you've got one ankle and you've got the De La Hiva hook on that and you've got your other leg free and you put it on the hip or the thigh. You push out to stretch the opponent's base and then you sit up and you try and come up uh, with essentially like a head outside single in no gi. But, you know, you can keep the gi in a, a gi match and you just hit a technical stand up and your De La Hiva hooking leg uh, pulls the opponent's ankle out as you're standing up. Uh, and he was trying to do that with like an, a head outside single. And the danger of that is that you, you can give up your back. You can give up the uh, crucifix position. And that's what so, sort of happened. He ended up giving up like a crucifix position, but again, scrambled throughout of it. Um, but it was a really interesting sweep attempt. And you also saw like uh, right at the start of the scrambling exchanges, he got the body lock on uh, Sanhagen from the back. Um, and Sanhagen was standing and he tried to, to take him down. And what you're seeing a lot of guys do now is just go for the crab ride. Um, it, you know, rather than trying to jump on someone's back, you put your feet, you put uh, your inste- insteps, fuck. Uh, well, like the your ankles, basically. You put butterfly hooks in the back of their knees and you pull them back. And that's a real old school wrestling technique. Like That's catch wrestling stuff. Um, and one of the, the fascinating thing about it is that, like that is a really old wrestling style. But it's also a very modern style because guys like the Meow Brothers, um, Mikey Musumi- Musumichi, you know, you know, all these guys who are great at like um, back takes, gi and no gi, they're masters of getting to that crab ride position. And it links very closely with some of the like leg drag stuff you can do from the top. Um, but the fascinating thing about it is that it's a newish position for BJJ and grappling stuff, but it's an old position for wrestling. And you watch... Um, Sakuraba versus Carlos Newton, old, old fight. And, you know, you, you go back and you go like, eh, well, it's an old fight. Guys maybe don't do that anymore. In that Newton fight, Newton has the back clinch or the uh, the back body lock, and he tries to pull Sakuraba back onto him. And Sakuraba uh, scoots his butt over one of 
Newton's knees and starts looking for the knee bar. I think that's the finish. He gets the knee bar from there. But now you're seeing guys like Gregor Gillespie, Raphael Asuncao, people like that, sitting down with the, with the grapevines, or the crab ride rather, and guys trying to scoot their hips backwards over one knee and, and pull the leg through. Um, and, you know, uh, Sanhagen did it here. Uh, guys have been doing it to the meows for a while. You know, they realize if you pull one leg through, you can stop them going to your back. You can start like a, a leg lock scramble. Um, and um, Yancy Medeiros was trying it against Gregor Gillespie. But ultimately, I think Gregor Gillespie basically swept and came up on top into like a leg drag position. But that's an old, old, old school move, butt scooting back over the knee and trying to get the knee bar. Um, and it's it's becoming more relevant as uh, the crab ride becomes more ubiquitous. Common. I won't say ubiquitous. Common. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I rambled about that for ages, but um, really, really good fight. And Corey Sanhagen was a massive favourite coming to this. I was really surprised. I saw, I saw, I saw some people online being like, oh, I don't know much about Sanhagen, but I heard Jack Slack praise him, so... Uh, he's you know I'll, I'll give him a good chance or bet on him or whatever um and you know Corey Sanhagen has always been a joke because uh a couple of guys who are friends of the podcast um are, are in his camp and uh, they was like you should talk about Corey Sanhagen and he's just been quietly storming through the bantamweight ranks and every time I pretend that I've never heard of him and go oh yeah this Corey Sanhagen is pretty good but I mean now people will have heard of him he's he's very good um and you know another great performance for a sunset because he looks good but loses but everyone who watched it knows he's good. So the UFC can keep him on the undercards, never give him any, any attention. You know, he got one knockout a little while ago and everyone was like, this is the start of something. <laughs> and it, it just wasn't. Um, yeah, I love him. I, I think, uh, you know, I'm just going to leave him there. And in five, ten years time, I'll come back to him for an article or a book or something and be like, uh, unheralded legend, <laughs> Raphael Sunset. No one cared about him in his own time. Karma Worthy versus, or Kama Worthy. Karma Worthy is, is my Reddit posting history. Um, Kama Worthy versus Devontae Smith. Th- this was, I think it was a last minute replacement, wasn't he? But they were previously training partners. Kama Worthy strikes like an anthropomorphized chicken. Um, he really moves weirdly. Uh, it's just constantly like, mm, you know, uh, I, well, you can't see me doing it, but I'm doing like the, the chicken dance from Arrested Development. But proper weird properly weird and Devonte smith looked a lot more polished but again like training with someone they know what you do anyway <laughs> no matter if you're much better than them i don't well that you 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 probably will know tons of gym killers but there are so many guys who uh do um you know are like the best guy on the team in the gym but then some guy that they whoop in the gym every day is actually the gym's best performer in competition um you know, it's really weird, the difference between the gym and under the lights. But I feel like you got a sense of that in this one, because you were looking at Karma Worthy going, this guy does not look UFC ready, and Devontae Smith is pretty good. And then you're looking at them and going, Devo- but Devontae Smith is clearly terrified of this man. Um, and rightly so, because he got starched. Um, wasn't a great fight. Won't write home about it too much, but it's just a very interesting dynamic between the two of them. And Karma Worthy either is going to revolutionise the striking game with this bizarre chicken style, or at some point we'll face someone who's going to slap the shit out of him for it. Well, I mean, he's 15 and 6, so he's probably already met six people who slapped the shit out of him for it. But um, interesting nonetheless. I, it, moving on to other bad striking styles, <laughs> Derek Brunson actually put on a blinder. Um, I was watching this one with my wife and I was going like, I love Ian Heinrich. She's like, why? It looks like he's losing. I was going, but is he? Because <laughs> like any time he gets taken down, he just does like a, a backwards roll over the top of Brunson uh, and then is back out onto the feet where he's knackered and, and losing. But he's never like held down and controlled. Um, Ian Heinrich has the weirdest style that you'll you'll see probably in the UFC, but I love it. Uh, after that shoe face fight where his answer to like, world-class jiu-jitsu was nah mate i'm just gonna roll <laughs> i'm just gonna gramby deal with it um yeah i mean comes out kicks brunson in the head and immediately and me and the missus both went <laughs> and then you know we assumed it was a quick stoppage and then suddenly uh <laughs> Derek brunson is lifting him into the air and carrying him around while ian heinich is like no nah, don't take me down please don't take me down uh loads of instances in this fight where brunson has him up on one leg like in the high ankle position or even like a what's it called a tree topler where you're pushing the ankle up as high as possible to get them to fall over and heinich is like in a standing split going no i will not fall over um but i mean heinich was using a ton of energy here and he was getting very tired very quickly and he was throwing like these big bombs and brunson to his credit was actually i won't say 
But I'll say he was more measured in his striking. He was still putting his chin out there on a platter constantly. But he was just like pop, pop rather than, you know, running and swing wild like the, the Derek Brunson MO. Uh, he's at a new camp and they, they seem to have fixed some stuff with him. But, you know, it's still, it's absolutely bizarre. He can't throw a punch without throwing his head back. You know, there's a thing in, um, I think it's Olympic, Olympic lifters that have head whip where you... you clean the bar up to your, you know, to your, uh, what's it called, clean position? Well, I don't know. Um, you clean the bar, and you're ready to, to put it up, but when you clean, you whip your head back as hard as possible. And by doing this hundreds of times, these guys actually get neck injuries um, just from, you know, from a part that's not actually under strain of the bar. You're just throwing your head back so hard. Um, and he, he has that on his punches. I wish he'd stop doing it. It's, it makes me really angry watching it. It makes it hard to watch his fights. It's, even when he's putting in a good performance like this one, I like this is making me super angry. But I'm glad he's with the new team and they seem to have got him out of the idea that just overwhelming people is enough because he got into the top 10 just overwhelming people if you watch him against the scourge of mma union sam alvey fighting for the right to everyone not be paid equal um, he uh just ran in on him just ran in on him and he just kept doing it and then eventually hammered alvey with some punches hard enough to knock him down he is scary enough that he could just fight in a way that is really shit and still beat the majority of the people on earth um which, I mean, will take us on to the main event in a minute. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that someone's actually doing something with Brunson that uses his abilities without being like, just lean on this. You know, just the abilities. Fight however you want and, and we'll win somehow. Then you had Mr. Black Explosive himself, uh, friend of the podcast, Sadiq Yusuf versus Gabriel Benitez. Yusuf looked great here. It looked like a, a young Sandy Sadler or George Foreman just went out, out there with his palms out, parrying the punches, throwing hard bombs, landed a beautiful was it a, a right hand counter over the top. I think there was another open side counter. I can't remember, but it was a it was a lovely right hand. Put the guy down um, and and finished. And yeah, felt quicker than it was four fourteen. I was going to say it felt like it was two minutes, but um, good on Sadiq. Like I said, friend of the show and entertaining fighter. You know, it, sometimes we have friends of the show who are boring and that's that's hard work. But, you know, we've got a friend of the show who's interesting. We like that a lot. Right. Roydy boys. Paulo Costa versus Yol Romero. I got a preview article out for the Patreon boys on Friday, I think it was. And if you haven't read it and you are a Patreon boy, go read it because I think it was pretty... Um, I, th I think I summed up pretty much a lot of the stuff that ended up being in the main playoffs of this fight. I said that Paulo Costa strikes me as an Well, firstly, I was like, you know, Yo Rivera, we sort of put him above the division now because he's so easily destroyed um, Rockhold and basically everyone else who's not Robert Whittaker. You know, I, I said I, in the piece, I was like, Robert Whittaker uh, beat Yo, Yo Romero, but he handled Romero. He contained him and outmaneuvered him, whereas everyone else, Yo Romero has just destroyed. That's, you know, there is a clear difference in how they're winning. Um, and, you know, what I was saying about this one was that I think Paulo Costa, if he fights how he has fought up to now, because he could have got in there. I was completely prepared for him to get in there and be awed by Ramiro and get into a staring contest or like a, a slow paced kickboxing match. The kind that just doesn't favor him at all. But I said if he fights the way that he has fought, um, he provides a very interesting test for Ramiro because Ramiro's thing is being left alone you know he the reason that he's so scary is that he's so explosive and you're like but he doesn't get tired and a lot of why he doesn't get tired is because he's left alone for long periods of the fight where he just sort of dances around the cage you know there was a whole round in the second Whitaker fight where he didn't throw anything um but costa got on him from the opening bell pushed him back hit him with the body kicks into the swinging combinations throwing constant body punches um, clearly Ramiro got tired quite early but by the end of it I mean Ramiro was coming back because Costa was even more tired it was very impressive um, performance by Costa but then you know very impressive performance by Ramiro to get back in it annoying thing where Ramiro keeps sticking his tongue out some people speculating that he got hit hard in the jaw early on could be actually um, but it, it just looked like I, I'm really not tired I'm pretending to pant to play up the fact that I'm not tired but I mean mad impressive like Romero took him down he got in on his hips perfect in the, in the first round in like the first exchange of the first round and Costa was just like nah not having that <laughs> doesn't matter that you're Olympic caliber wrestler and have been doing this your whole life I'm not having it um so what I said going into this fight was like the thing about Romero is that especially if you're put on the cage there's some subtlety needed there. You know, some guys counterpunch off the cage, but you shouldn't. It's not 
really reliable if you're dealing with a guy who's going to swarm in with volume and hit your body most importantly you know if you're just standing there moving your head and they're punching only at your head like anderson silver um then you're all right but even anderson silver put against good people like costa would have real trouble along the fence um you know, watch the fight with Michael Bisping. It's not Michael Bisping being magic. It's Michael Bisping mixing up his targets, throwing feints, showing him different looks instead of just swinging for his head. Um, that means that Silva can't really counterpunch off the fence. But Ramiro's options off the fence that he uses are really just two things. He'll drop for the takedown attempt or he'll jump for the flying knee. And if you remember round four from the first Whitaker fight, Whitaker gets him hurt uh, and, and pursues him. And rem- or uh, He might be tired, I can't remember which, but he's like clearly there is a moment in the fight where Whitaker realises, oh, maybe I could finish this guy. And he moves in and Ramiro's running along the fence and he just keeps fainting so that Ramiro's like diving for the legs, jumping for the knee. There's never anyone there. And then Rami- uh, Whitaker's on him immediately after he's come down or got up from his uh, his big attempt. So my big thing going into this fight was like, what does he have to get off the fence aside from those two things? If, if if he can't just level change onto Costa's hips and take him down, you know, what has he got? And of course that Costa doesn't run onto a flying knee. I mean, the main thing that I got from this fight is that like, you know, cancel the Sada, mate, because it was so much fun. Um, just big roidy boys swinging at each other. Uh, I was just going to my wife, how old do you think that guy is? Gone. How old do you think he is? And then uh, she'd go like, oh, I don't know, you know, 30. And I go, no, 40. Ha. And then they go, yo, Ramiro, 42. And I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, this is getting ridiculous now. Yeah, you know, Randy Couture at 46 on all the roids in the world still looked very deflated. Uh, probably on all the roids in the world. Well, you know, they weren't tested back then. Um, <laughs> his nickname was The Natural. <laughs> Oh, anyway, uh, moving on from the Roydy boys. Someone made a really good um, pre-fight hype package about this with just like Joe Rogan and Brendan Shaw jizzing themselves over these two guys and how big they are. Um, And then I'm watching it go, this is hilarious. And then midway through, I hear my voice going, he is the juiciest slut on the roster. Um, And if you're arguing that they're not on drugs, you're really just arguing that they haven't failed the test. And I I don't know if I continued to say this in in the actual podcast, but... You know, they actually both have failed tests. Uh, great thing to remember just before this fight. Paulo Costa got caught using an illegal IV. That is not a big offence. That's, you know, if you're using an illegal IV, that's just rehydrating, technically. I mean, you hear stories about, I think it was Floyd Mayweather ran to get, like, two IV bags and squeeze them into his arm when you saw them were coming. I can't remember if that was Floyd or someone else. But um, illegal IV, generally, not a huge deal. But... Paul Acosta gets a reduction in his sentencing for a for a uh, IV use for giving information. So you're like, what fucking information does he have? I could make a saline drip. I could probably MacGyver a saline drip out of the avian water bottle that I'm looking at. And I don't know, a piece of tubing. Uh, <laughs> like the idea that USADA got information from him that's so important that they could reduce his sentence, but also that he's not doing drugs. I mean, how stupid do you have to be? I just want to ask you, Sada, you know, sorry, what information did you garner from Paulo Costa that, that helped you with your investigations, given that he is, you know, completely clean aside from uh, an illegal IV? Anyway, Nate Diaz versus Anthony Pettis. This one wasn't quite the banger that people expected, because I expected um, either Pettis to find that leg kick early and D- Diaz to just do another stumbling towards his man and falling over performance, or I expected Pettis to just melt, um, you know, like he often does. And, uh, you know, I think it probably was the three rounds that did it. Five rounds, I think you'd probably see more time for one of those things to establish themselves. And it looked more like Pettis was going to melt. Something I was surprised that no one really commented on in this fight, and I think it kind of got missed because Pettis switches stances so often. Um, but Diaz was fighting from orthodox at range and then doing a big step into southpaw to get inside so that he was never uh it, it seemed as though it was so that he was never southpaw uh, while in low kicking range um which i thought was really quite clever uh, you know he so basically you know it, it made for kind of an ugly fight because it was just him sort of stepping in on his man and no one really landing anything until they were in close um but it, it just meant that his main stance was never compromised by taking low kicks and he didn't even take that many from an orthodox stance he actually checked one and i think it broke pettis's foot and this is the thing like with pettis the fragility or the injury proneness you know it used to be that he was getting injured before his fights and he couldn't fight as often now he's getting injured in the fights and it tends to like you know i'm not going to accuse anyone of making excuses but there is always that thing at the end where it's like well he did break his rib 
hand, foot, whatever. Um, you know, he's getting injured quite a lot. And some of that's probably luck. But again, like, you just maybe at that point it's time to say, okay, maybe I shouldn't be fighting anymore or, or getting hit professionally anymore. Um, I think when your own um, striking surfaces are the things getting injured, that's problematic. That's a real problem. Uh, you know, how many boxers have you seen, like, their career completely change basically by getting brittle hands uh, and now Pettis is he's got one hand that apparently was becoming a problem breaking and now he's just broken his foot so um not great and that was one of the things i was saying when we were talking about like the the, the preamble to this fight i was saying you know if diaz is is pressuring into on the fence one of the things that Pettis has never been able to do really well is just blast dudes off him um, because uh, we were talking about like you know the uh, old Romero has flying knee drop on hips, but even beyond that, like you know there's there's clever circling and stuff. Eddie Alvarez is the king of getting off the fence. Um, but even then, if you can just grit your teeth and throw a couple of hard punches to get the other guy off you, you know it's not the thing is like if you move one way, get them swinging and they move back the other. That mechanically works you know if they are swinging to where you're going to be over there but then you change direction they aren't going to be able to catch up with you quick enough um hitting someone as they're coming in you are at a mechanic you know you're at a technical and positional disadvantage because you're being backed up you're a long defense maybe your stance has shortened a bit um and and they're coming in and they've got all the advantages basically but if you hit them decently you've got a chance of affecting their um you know their mind a little bit Making them think, fuck, that hurt. That, it was supposed to be easy just walking in on on the fence over there. Um, so if you can just crack people hard coming in, that's always a good get out of jail free card. Or at least, you know, buys you some time between exhaustive attempts to circle out at speed. Um, and Pettis has never had that. Like, he's never really been able to punch people off him. And that really was obvious against um, Rafael Dos Anjos, who just didn't give a shit. He moved in, smashed him with like three punches to the body, and then Pettis would punch back as hard as he could, and, and Dos Anjos would just put his guard up and be like, yeah, whatever, and then move back in. Lots of cool infighting stuff from Nate. You know, they, he's a good infighter. He's one of the few guys that I show quite often because of especially those McGregor performances where he free uses his head to free his arms and then hits the body along the fence lovely stuff good with knees along the fence uh hurt McGregor with a knee along the fence had Cerrone with like a single underhook pin and just hit him with like 50 punches in the face along the fence but one of those ones where it's like in front of your own head so it doesn't really actually do much but yeah good infighter and he did good infighting in this fight I thought the Pettis guillotine looked sharp. And, uh, you know, I said this at the end of my article. I was like, I don't expect extended ground sequences from these two, but it'd be really fun if they did. <laughs> and, you know, the, the bits that we got on the ground were really fun. Right, so main event time. Uh, a lot of people loved this fight. I mean, it was fun, but I'm going to say that it was a mess. Um, basically, Stipe Miocic fought the worst way he possibly could for three rounds and then found something that he should have been looking for the entire fight in the fourth round and it was very clear that he'd only just hit on this rather than been training for his entire camp because he was so surprised it worked that he just did it over and over again with no setup little variation just over and over again now i did the filthy casuals guide to this but i also did a unibit article in the filthy casuals guide i just covered like the basics of how the cormier mummy guard stuff works in the unibit um, article i talked about how you know, I, I said in the um, the Filthy Catcher's Guide, I said, you know, it, it creates other openings, you know, it is to shut down one thing. And that, you know, that we were talking about how, like, it's not great for boxers to, to bar punches anymore because it doesn't give you a lot of counter-punching opportunities. The reason it works for Cormier is because he's just looking for the clinch. And it also opens up a lot of other openings on you when you're doing it. Um, and then in the Unibet article, we actually talked about those openings. The body, obviously, completely open. Uh, and the legs are very vulnerable because he's always like side on reaching out for dudes. But, you know, so we were saying Steve Miocic should be targeting the body. Ideally, left body kick, lots of low kicks. Um, he did hit a nice knee to the body in one round. And I was like, oh, now it's starting. And then he didn't do it for another like 15 minutes. Um, and, you know, but hooks to the body and upcuts to the body should have been the go to because Daniel Cormier's ha and if someone was saying to, the, to me, um, I've seen a few people saying, like, why wasn't he jabbing? And you're like, the one thing that Daniel Cormier's guard, that reaching stuff, is set up to do is to stop straight hitting. It wasn't Stipe trying to hand fight that was getting him beat up. It was that he was trying to jab, and that was getting him into a hand fight. You know, the one thing that Cormier is set up to shut down 
Stipe came in and tried to do for three rounds and, and utterly failed. Um, the, the few occasions he did well with the jab were when he backed up a good distance and then Cormier was having to walk forward because he doesn't feel comfortable reaching while he's walking to the guy. Uh, and then Stipe would jump down the middle with like a, an up jab into a right straight. But most of the time, Cormier was staying in distance and smothering the hands, checking the path of the jab, you know, so you have to go around the outside. Um Finally, Miocic in the fourth round finds the, the left hook to the body and he just goes to it over and over again. So clearly just found it in that moment. I'm just thinking, how did his team not bring him in just ready to punch the body and kick the legs? How? You know, um, I, I, I was looking at him in round one and going, fucking hell, he's lean for this fight. You know, he must have had a really serious camp, got serious about it. You know, I'm sure he wasn't not serious about it the first time around, but he was clearly in fantastic shape. But it seemed like that was all they'd done. Is he Team Strong Style or Ayama or someone like that? Is he the team that were... It was one of those teams where they would talk about how they don't check low kicks and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, that's that's not a good idea. Um, but yeah, just... I was very, very surprised how badly he fought uh, and then still eventually found the thing that he should have been looking for for the previous three rounds. Um, and Cormier beat him up for three rounds. Cormier looked... Uh, good lots of eye pokes in this one though I mean a couple of them were punches and one of them was a thumb along the side which is more dangerous for the poker if anything because if you break your thumb on the side of someone's head that's not good um, but you know it's not good that he's doing it him let's be fair here John Jones Steve Hemiotri Daniel Cormier Alexander Gustafsson Rumble Johnson all these guys at the top of the middle sorry the light heavyweight and heavyweight division legendary eye pokers I think at some point you have to say we want guys to be able to use their open palms to check strikes and, and turn over on elbows and all the interesting stuff that opens up by being able to control the opponent's wrists and hands. Um, why don't we just fix the fucking gloves? Which is what the UFC said they were doing in 2009 and they still haven't done. So Stephen Miocic runs a Homer Simpson performance and gets the win. Uh, people said they'd be fine with a rematch. <laughs> the best take on this was uh, Scott Coker coming out because we've got this garbage Bellator card this weekend and nothing else going on. It's um, four heavyweights in the in the main and co-main. Uh, and uh, Scott Coker's reaction was to tweet, Ryan Bader is the best heavyweight in the world. <laughs> Fuck's sake, Scott. Grow the fuck up. We're all embarrassed for you. You know, and uh, Teep to the Jump was, was on full damage control. He was saying, well, actually, you've said that he's, you know, the, the Reddit post said greatest in the world. And Scott actually said best. And, you know, everyone else's reaction was like, it's equally embarrassing. My reaction was, I feel like they are two very different things, best and greatest. But Ryan Bader having beaten zero good heavyweights, uh, probably equally responsible for him being not the greatest and not the best. So that was UFC 241, and I thought it was a pretty good card. Um, I It peaked early. I think that's the thing. You know, we had um, great Sanhagen versus a Sun Sao fight. I was so hype off that. I mean, even close versus uh, Yagos was good, and Kenny versus uh, Bermuda. So that was three in a row, hype, hype, hype. You know, three decisions, so that's, what is that? 45 minutes of, of solid hype there. Karma Worthy gets a quick knockout. Derek Brunson versus Heinich was good. Sadiq Youssef was great. And then you got Paulo Costa versus Yo Romero, which could, should have been a main event on another card. Um, and then, you know, Nate Diaz versus Pettis was a bit of a letdown in terms of it going only three rounds and, and just not being as exciting as, well, maybe, again, maybe it's because I was so hyped for Romero versus Costa. I was just like, meh. Uh, and then the main event was kind of like bad MMA, to be honest, because it's, it's probably weird because Stephen Miocic has put on some of the smartest performances I've ever seen. Well, one of versus Francis Ngannou. Daniel Cormier put on a masterclass in their first fight and, um, you know, the second John Jones fight, though he lost it, I think that was some of the highest level MMA you, you will see anywhere at the moment. You know, it'll be surpassed in a couple of years, I'm sure. But like that and the two Whitaker versus Romero fights, you're talking the highest level of MMA. Um, and then to see them just both looking just <laughs> not great here, not great. Uh, well, you know, some fights are like that. Some fights are more heart and grit than they are doing the smart thing. Um, but, you know... I will remember UFC 241 positively, is what I'm saying. Right, let's do a couple of questions before we get out of here for this week. Dear Jack, can't I be listening to you because I'm a Valentina fan who also knows she's painfully dull in a lot of her fights, and I want to hear you rip on her for it? Regards, Ben. P.S. I was spanking it during your podcast, but not because you were talking about how shit she is. I just love listening to your honeyed tones and your mellifluous voice. 
Or I might have been thinking about Valentina's sexy ass and that little dance she does when she wins. Okay, it was both. Thank you, Ben. I just wanted to read that out because it was fun. Um, hello, Mr. Slack. I'm a fairly new fan to MMA and a recent fan of yours as well, so I may be asking a question without really knowing what I'm talking about here, but this has been the in the back of my mind for a few weeks and I would love to hear your take. Not to beat this Luke Rockhold thing to death, oh God, <laughs> he almost has been at this point, um, but much has been made about the right cross that his last opponents have all used to knock him out. It's almost something of a fail-safe Luke defaults to when he's pressured and backed up, and it would be very hard to, to work out of his fights as it's so ingrained in his muscle memory. Okay, I'm assuming you're get, talking getting hit with the right while leading back in the in the hook, or what, you know, leading back for the hook or whatever it is. Um, obviously, fighters need these for when there isn't enough time to think about what they ought to do next. But because Luke's is so exploitable, I thought, what could a new fighter do to avoid these sort of defensively unsound tactics from developing? I read a comment once from a karate fighter who explained that the kata he had was very intense work because every movement he had to do was near perfect. I've heard people scoff at the idea of kata, including you, Jack, um, but I think that for developing these sort of defensive fundamentals, it could be used to make sure newer fighters don't get into the bad habits. Could there be something to this, or is drilling just the better way to go? Thanks, Jack. Love your podcast, and keep up the great work. Praise be to Gaethje, Big Will. Um, I think when you're talking about kata and forms, you're talking about uh, two different things, you know, not cat and forms being different things, I just mean forms generally, there are two different things. One is the ritualization of combat, which is basically like time immemorial. If you came back to the cage having hunted, uh, I don't know, what the fuck do people have? I wanted to say mammoth, but I feel like that probably takes a few people to do. Um, if you came back to the, to the cave having hunted something, you would then tell your kids how you did it and show them how to throw a spear and shit like that. And that's ritualization, and that's what people... Or some people think the idea of uh, of forms is uh, the other is to hide techniques in plain sight. So you basically you'd have someone working on well in like um, Okinawa you you would work on your naihanshi or your teki or whatever you want to call it kata um, for three years on one, and then you would be shown like two man drills for how the the moves you've been doing, which are which are you know pretty impractical on their own, how they fit in with actual habitual acts of violence. So ultimately, you're doing the moves but in a way where you don't actually learn anything from them until the guy who's teaching you wants to show you what they mean. Basically, I mean, that's my opinion on forms generally. Look at them as a historical document, something someone has put into... I mean, it's nothing more than a dance, really. You know, it's just... If you don't have the meanings there, it's, it's nothing more than a dance. If you find the meanings, it gets a bit more interesting, or if you look for the meanings. Looking at old forms is like a... a Something I do for fun, you know, I just like looking at um, old styles of, of kung fu and, and things like that, um, and, and just looking at where, you know, like the low single uh, appears in some really old forms. People very quickly worked out that if you go against the inside of the knee, you can take people down. Um, and things like that are just very interesting. Um, and, and the you know, we said habitual acts of violence. That's something I, I took from Patrick McCarthy. Um, but habitual acts of violence are things that are fairly common attacks that can be anticipated and a lot of them are like regardless of culture you will find people grab you by the lapels or by the hair or by the throat you know in very similar ways so a lot of forms have very similar um ideas from their attackers and that stuff you know when you're talking like stepping punches and stuff you're talking like eh, that's not really very interesting but um in terms of what you're talking about here there are already uh, forms and, and rituals for developing uh, to prevent yourself from developing bad technique and that's shadow boxing you know that's what you should be doing all the time shadow boxing admits and and well sparring is really just like the step before fighting that's really pressure testing stuff but the way you should be developing stuff is is in your shadow boxing and on the mitts and you know even in front of the bag and things like that all those secondary activities that aren't actually fighting but are part of learning to fight those are when you're developing that and those are you know that is just what people think kata is you know it's just repeating things into um muscle memory i don't know what it is about luke that makes him do like the lean back well i do know what it is about luke that makes him lean back for the check hook it's worked for a very long time you know he he ran through strike force got through to the ufc championship without ever meeting anyone who could exploit it um, and then suddenly dude started and it really got problematic for him. 
um, and he was relying on it very heavily. You know, he's gone to other stuff. He's, he's actually shown some really interesting stuff, like triple jabs and uh, more interesting kicking and stuff. But again, like he's had the same thing with his kicks, and we were talking about this in the pre-fight Costa versus um, Romero article. I was saying I would love to see Romero as a southpaw use the cross check with his with his lead knee and shin to check those body kicks before they even get going, because. Uh, Luke Rockhold has just had this career where he can kick as hard as he likes and because he's kicking against people's arms they're not going to be able to do anything about it if you pick up a, a knee and a shin you know the top portion of your shin if you put that in front of someone's kick doesn't matter who they are uh, and I used the Sam A versus um, John Haggerty example I said from Sam A to Sam Z never stops hurting if you kick hard into a check um, I think a lot of what is wrong with Luke Rockhold and I say wrong sorry I, I think a lot of what is it's a problem for Luke Rockhold has become a problem because it's worked for so long. I, I feel like if no one is punishing bad habits, they become habits. <laughs> you know, like that's that's the thing. It's going to take some time to train that out of him, and I don't know if he's got uh, good enough coach. Well, not good enough, but I don't think he's got. I don't know if he's got harsh enough coaches to to actually train it out of him. Plus, the fact that his chin is clearly somewhat giving out now. I mean, that's uh, probably a bigger problem. Because he could start fighting perfect fights. I thought he looked pretty good against um, Ramiro until he got cornered. But he could fight perfect fights and then still just get clipped and go unconscious. You know, at some point, the chin is an issue. Anyway, cheers, Will. Jack, could you talk about the classic low kick to the thigh compared to the low low kick to the calf? What are the advantages and disadvantages of both? And how do they compare to each other? I've been... I've seen it suggested that the low low kick is just superior and that fighters should only be throwing these to the legs. What do you think? Cheers, Cheers, Jack. Oh, it's from another Jack. Okay. Um, I think we've probably talked about this a few times before, but part of why the low, low kick isn't a thing in like Muay Thai is because the longer stance in, in MMA and the heavier stance means that it's there. I mean, Dom Cruz said this the other night too, but um, I'm just repeating it again. We've we talked about it before Dom Cruz did. I'll just, just be clear. Um, but one of the interesting things about the low, low kick is that basically the closer you get to the knee, the harder the surface you're kicking. Um, and, and that's why whenever I say like, check a kick I, I say top of the shin maybe even the knee you know like kick, getting someone to kick your kneecap will probably break their foot or shit or lower shin but um you probably don't want them to kick your kneecap because it's something that can move but like top end of the shin if you like feel the the lumpy top bit of the bone of the top end of your shin you can take a kick in that and it doesn't really hurt that much either like compared to getting kicked in the middle of the shin um that fucking hurts but uh you know you'll hear in, basically anyone who knows what they're talking about with with checks they'll say this like you know check lower down the shin in training and try and check as high on the shin as possible um in in fights but you know the check is something you know you're not actually attacking someone with a check a check is really only as punishing as the opponent kicking you uh or as the, rather as the opponent's kick is because you're making them kick into a hard surface uh you are just being the hard surface the <clears throat> the thing about the low low kick is that it's already below the knee if you pick your leg up to check they are going to hit lower on the shin and it's going to be flapping in the air too you know your, your leg's going to be loose at that end and you, you saw it against um, Gilbert Melendez Jeremy Stevens Gilbert Melendez was kick, picking his leg up to check and Jeremy Stevens would just, just go straight through like at his ankle just clack straight through it and uh, Gilbert Melendez would put his leg down and it'd just be dead and he'd fall over you can't lower your leg to check kicks. So if you start lower than what would really hurt if they checked it, you know, anytime they pick their leg up, you're just going to hit something softer underneath. So that's one advantage of the low, low kick. Harder to step in on is another one. You know, if you if you kick someone in the thigh, all they need to do is when they're in that heavy stance, step forward a little bit, maybe out a little bit, bend the knee into the kick, make the angle so that the, the kick runs up the front of the quadricep and into the hip. Uh, and you can catch it there, but you can also step down the center with the right hand. So checks and counters a little bit harder against low, low kicks. Really, the answer to the low, low kick is to pull your leg out of the way. And finally, dudes are fucking doing that. It's the same as with the oblique kick and the low line side kick. Move your leg. <laughs> Don't just pick it up and try and check every time. And then, of course, there's a slight difference in range as well. If, you, if you're, if um, you know, we're always talking about nearest target, longest weapon. Um... Side kick is generally considered like one of the longer weapons, but only if you're standing bladed. Uh, and also like lead leg kicking, you have to do something with your rear leg before you kick. Whereas rear leg kicking, and this is one that always confuses people with round kicks. Um, rear leg kicking can be longer than lead leg kicking without stepping 
or, or certainly is without stepping. With with the step, you can make some distance, but you're having to step first. Um, rear leg kick, kicking, your lead leg's already there, anchored. You just need to kick. You don't have to do any preliminary motion. So it's quite nice that the, there is a, a way to get to basically just above your opponent's foot because you're talking about the, the calf rather than the thigh. You know, your opponent, if they've got decently spread feet, uh, their thigh is, a, you know, a good few inches maybe half a foot back from their foot so the lower down you kick that the the closer uh the the target is to you and this is a game where inches make all the difference so that's helpful i think mainly the 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 thing is that it's quite easy to do without being punished because so few of the defensive options are as effective as against the um the thigh kick you know and and people are especially like defensively people do tend to treat them as the same thing even though they're not really i'm sure we're going to talk about this more in like weeks to come because it's it's becoming a constant now but you know it, it's kind of like the the oblique kicks and the side kicks uh, to the to the knee i was I, I was saying in 2013 or whenever jones started using them against was that like 2011 actually whenever jones started using them against um rampage i was like yeah well they're not unstoppable and then for about five years everyone was like they are actually unstoppable and now people are finally doing the things to get their leg out of the way at the kick um it takes a while for people to catch up sometimes but people caught up on it being a useful weapon almost immediately there don't seem to be any of the scruples that there were about uh straight kick in the front of the knee um so you i presume people are doing them to each other every day in training so you're going to see guys pick on it probably a little bit quicker um defensively rather than the they did with the oblique kick and the side kick where you were a bit more reluctant to throw them in training and some guys like Stephen Thompson hate throwing them in competition. They're just like, ah, don't do that. Even though he's probably the guy who could benefit the most from a low-line sidekick. Anyway, cheers, Jack. And cheers to me, Jack. If you want to get in on the Patreon, read all the uh, Patreon previews, the Patreon studies, various stuff we've done on, like Cyril Garn, John Haggerty, uh, the Ramiro Costa fights. You know, stuff goes out every week. Um, join up to the Patreon, help support the podcast. If you want to read what I'm doing at any time or have written at any time, fightprimer.com. And if you want to send an email to the podcast, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack. Beefy boys in banana hammocks banging on the beach, bless.